Welcome to From Doubt to Drive, Entrepreneurs Only. Join us on an inspired journey through the ups and downs of successful entrepreneurs. Our hosts, Mario C. Bauer and Florian Schneider, will explore how conquering doubt is essential for entrepreneurs to truly unleash drive. By being a part of our community, you too can learn how to propel from doubt to drive. So tune in, buckle up, oh, and enjoy. So welcome, everybody. What a special day. We are recording today our first episode of our podcast from Doubt to Drive. Florian, are you the same excited as I am? I'm totally excited. It's going to be great. Great it's journey. Gonna be, it's going to be a journey. And we start this podcast series with a bang, with one of the guys who doesn't need any introduction in our beloved industry. It's Henry McGovern. Welcome, Henry. Hi, Henry. Great to be here. It's kind of crazy. We're in three different places, one of them including Sri Lanka. It should definitely be an interesting meeting. <laughs> that's that's for sure. That's for sure. Uh, absolutely. But before we start, Mario, you said uh, Henry is well known, but maybe some of our listeners do actually not know Henry McGovern that well. So I would do a little introduction what he okay, go, actually go achieved ahead. over the past Decades. Uh, I mean, he's a serial entrepreneur and founded Amrest in 1993, when I'm right. Um, yes. Opening the first Pizza Hut in Wroclaw in Poland. He's an American, but he is somehow stranded in uh, in Eastern Europe. And from Poland, he actually conquered Europe and the world uh, with a lot of uh, multiple acquisitions and rapid organic growth. He built Amrest up to uh, 2,300 restaurants in 28 countries and uh, sold it uh, in 2019. After this, he actually uh, didn't retire. He actually became more active uh, than ever, uh, setting up an investment fund called uh, McWin. Um, it's uh, 1 billion under management. So it's uh, actually really huge. And uh, McWin acquired uh, concepts like Losteria, Vapiano, Burger King, Gales, Big Mama recently sticks and sushi. So uh, I think a lot of experience in our first episode. So once again, Henry, uh, thank you for being with us and uh, welcome. It's a so pleasure. The, the, good, the good thing about this podcast, normally, Henry, we said every other guest will get a warmer question about the success, but you don't need a warmer question because you like to share the struggles and you sh like to, to share with the community. So I need to really dig in immediately into struggles. So we want to pick... An episode, uh, Henry, if you travel back in your Amherst time and what's the episode in Amherst where you say there you hit the wall? What was the, the moment when you struggled most? Oh, I don't know how many questions we're going to get today, but that one probably deserves a number of different answers. Um, well, let's we stay with you, that one. I'll take you back to the very first like opening and uh, it was November 8th. Uh, 1993, and we had the the night before we had the typical restaurant, you know, celebration dinner, and invited the city and invited uh, Don Kendall from PepsiCo and a couple of local dignitaries, and of course the staff. And I think there were like 80 people there, and I got up to give a speech, and my mouth was just horribly dry. It was just like. I couldn't believe how nervous I was. I, I just spent the last six months building this restaurant. And how could I have been that nervous? I knew pretty much everybody in the room. So I got through with that. And uh, I went up to Don Kendall. I was like, Don, you've got to give me some advice. I can't believe how difficult it was for me just to speak publicly. And he laughed and he said, you know, you're just going to have to do it again and again and again. So that's not really hitting the wall, but I want to show you from how low I came because it's kind of important to uh, to realize even the smallest things uh, can be difficult. So let's just fast forward one month. I didn't have to go very long before I, I hit the wall again, but this one was bad. Um, we uh, we opened our we opened the restaurant and sales were great. Um, it was kind of funny because back then you had millions of Zwadis, the exchange rate was 1600 to the dollar. So, um, and their lowest note was 50 Zwadis. And uh, it was worth, you know, nothing basically. And uh, 
sitting there counting money at the end of the day and we were off like 1500 zwaris and we counted it like three times and we realized oh damn we're you know that's only a dollar what are we wasting our time for right um but it gives you a sense of how much of a fish out of water i was and so a month later we were keeping our books um we had them in binders and everything was in order we thought but unbeknownst to us back then your vat invoices had to be in a very specific order and every invoice needed to have five different things on it very specific think communist poland almost at that time right and so everything was just super uh, mandated and very specific well we had just filed for a two hundred thousand dollar refund which probably the city of Wrocław had actually never seen um, didn't cross our mind. We had just invested a little more than a million dollars. And um, so we filed as we should have. Well, the tax office showed up and we were kind of frustrated because we were keeping things in Excel plus the Polish, um, you know, the Polish accounting system, but the Polish accounting system gave us no management reporting. So we were trying to reorganize everything into some Excel spreadsheets that we could understand and deal with. So we had all of our documents spread out on the floor in these binders and the tax office walks in. And basically it didn't meet a single standard for how we were supposed to keep the documents. Well, in those days, if you had a violation of how you kept your VAT documents or how you filed, the penalty was five times what you filed for. So we had just spent all of our money on building the restaurant. Actually, we're counting on the 200,000 refund and the tax office comes in and says, you owe us a million dollars. We didn't have a million dollars. And so, um, you know, we tell them that, like, uh, you know, this is impossible. We didn't do anything wrong. We certainly didn't mean to do anything wrong. And so we show up to work the next day and they've padlocked the front door and put a big sticker on the window. This is, this is our second month of operations, lines out the door and all of a sudden we show up in the press as, sorry, out of order, um, you know, tax violation. So I, I, I really was just beside myself. You can imagine everything I had saved, all my money was in there. I had borrowed money from Don Kendall. And um, so I had no way to solve this at all. And going to the tax office didn't, didn't seem to register or they didn't seem to care. So uh, I went to... Um, you know, it's one of those panic moments. And finally, I got an appointment with the U.S. ambassador in Warsaw, and I went up and I saw him and I said, you know, they may think that we're wealthy, but Don Kendall's not going to do this or Chris Eisenbeis, nobody else is going to put money in. I'm the operator. You know, what are we going to do? And um, I said, I'm just going to have to give them the restaurant. They can take the restaurant and I'll just leave the country. So he said, well, that's certainly not what the country wants. They don't want that story. So let's see what we can do. And he sent me also to the Poznan um, consulate office. And then I had to meet with, you know, a few other people. I got had got some of our suppliers of equipment to call and say, you know, this is an intention. PepsiCo got involved and made a few phone calls. And finally, as if doing me a favor, they said, okay, okay, uh, we get it. We don't want your restaurant. We'll just keep the two hundred thousand and call it even. So, uh, <laughs> it's like, wow, that's that's a painful lesson. So that was my, you know, after what was really a difficult summer, I, I had called my brother saying, "God, this place is so difficult because everything was difficult. I mean, even the weather that summer. I think I had it had to be the worst summer in in fifty years in Poland. It, it rained and was cold every day, and I was just this is kind of suffering through it all." And then that was the hit in the face for thinking I had done a really nice job for the city and, you know, renovated the first uh, first publicly sold building on the main square and thought I was doing a lot. So I guess there's a number of lessons in there, of just how out of place you can be in a new country and not realize the regulations or think you understand them, but you don't. Um, thinking you're doing something that people will notice and care about, but in bureaucracies, that gets mm. lost, you know, some other people come in and help, but, and then uh, when you're down, just, just call everybody you can and try and find, you know, something. Otherwise we were out of business before we even got started. Mm. 
I, I'm really happy you picked that story because people know you from now, having built a couple of thousand restaurants and running this successful McQueen ecosystem. But you picked the story of struggling with the first restaurant. I think that's a that's a story a lot of entrepreneurs can relate to. But what now looking back, what's important you think in such a phase to do to keep calm? Do you have like advice? You said calling a lot of people, getting advice, but what what actually pushed you through back then? What what is it? What makes it overcoming that struggle? Well, um, I had already developed Cisco Yes Mojliva even by then. Uh because you need to tell the listeners what that means. Oh, you mean the whole world doesn't know what Chisco is? Yeah, I, think, I, think, I think you need to go. Uh, <laughs> I cannot I can't what even spell it. What have I been doing it. for all this time? Jeez. Uh, alles ist möglich for the German yeah. listeners or todo possible for the Spanish or everything is possible, but it's not everything. And that's the problem with Spanish and 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 German and, and Polish as well. Uh, most languages don't have a differential between everything and anything. Right. And anything is possible that you put your mind to, but everything is clearly not. Um, so uh, I think that's the distinction. But, uh, you know, uh, that first that first restaurant, I mean, many people have heard the story of the telephone lines. Uh, I wanted to build the restaurant was on the ground floor of a seven story building. And I wanted to build the first class A office building in the city. And uh, I come to realize after I spent the money buying the building that it took 15 years to get a phone line. And I wanted 150 of them. Well, I wanted 50 data lines and a hundred uh, phone lines. That was, uh, that was kind of absurd as I, I found out. So I also thought I had lost everything uh, when I found that out. Um, we ordered all of the equipment, got it to the restaurant, and the city told us there wasn't enough electricity at the main square to actually run um, the size of equipment I had bought. So, you know, another learning there. So we spent $50,000 to create a whole new transformer in our backyard. We had to run a, a large cable and then do a transformation station on our own pocket. Um, so as you can hear, there it was story after story of... Um, running out, dying. It wasn't possible. Everybody told me this is Poland. It's not possible. Uh, that's not the way the system works. Can't do that. Uh, so I finally learned the three Polish words, Szczesko Jest Możliwe, just to respond with something. So I would just tell everybody I met, whether they were government or employees or contractors or whatever. I would be like, every single day I heard, it's not possible. It's not possible. So the way I got through it was just living to those words and they were very motivating for all of us of just like nope we're going to find a way it's possible we're going to find a way and so when we were shut down one month after i i couldn't exactly like not act like that you know it was possible to find a solution mm. so it I mean, became your mantra it became the 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 north the north star of your doing yeah, I, I, it, I laugh because my Polish is still pretty bad and my children really laugh at me. I mean, it's pathetic. But it's because I really didn't want to learn more than like, please, thank you, and anything is possible because I didn't want to have to like deal with conversations. I would just be like, no, nope, anything is possible. And that was the end of my language ability. So that's so uh, I, I just kept repeating it and repeating it. I mean, this is basically, this is the opposite from uh, doubt or struggle if you have the mantra or the understanding that everything is possible. There, there's one question, Henry. Did you ever had uh, second thoughts that you ended up in Poland or started all that in Poland? Because it's quite unusual oh, for you. Definitely. I, I, don't, I didn't and I don't write a lot of letters. Actually, it's one of the things I, I wish I did more often. I think it's a nice practice to sit down and send thank you notes or just postcards or whatever because people don't expect them anymore it's like kind of lost but i didn't even do it when when there was no email um and at one point i i just sat down and i wrote my brother i don't know if it was to clear my mind kind of some sort of meditational thing but i don't think i've used so many f words in one letter in my life it was like this effing country, this effing food, this effing weather, these effing people, this effing, effing, effing. It was just, it was so 
frustrating. Um, and I was really just kind of at the end of end of it. And um, yeah, so I sat down, I wrote him a, a letter on, you know, yellow legal pad. Uh, it wasn't very nice looking, but it, it really helped clear my mind. And I, I, I didn't think I was going to get there. Um, maybe I jumped to another story much later on. Um, Let's do that. We're in Spain in 2011, and uh, I'm trying to buy La Tagliatella. And many of you might know that Steve Winnegar is my partner today. That's where the name McWin comes from. It's Henry McGovern and Steve Winnegar, which created McWin. And um, But this is kind of how it began. I knew Steve because he had built two great businesses in in Spain and I had met him at you know different conferences etc but I didn't really know him and so uh I went out and I was trying to buy his business and Lion Capital had a contract to buy it that had just expired so I had a very short window to get a, a deal done and this was after the financial crisis so people were you know nervous and Steve had a private equity partner that owned the majority of the company. And so private equity was super concerned with exits at that time, because you, you, you know, you just didn't know where um, or how exits were going to go. And this was a really good exit for them. So um, I went out and a couple of the team members came out and Steve took my hand and said, yeah, we've got a deal, but he was the minority shareholder. Yeah. And, uh, so as the deal um, was progressing, this, um, this is extremely fast, but we went from a Sunday, now we're on a Wednesday or a Thursday. Uh, and you know, a couple of my team had come out, uh, Mark, our CFO, David, our, our legal counsel, and uh, Piot from finance. And we're, we're digging through stuff. And Lion Capital found out we were there and in the building and, and then called up and said, what the hell is going on? Uh, You know, I don't know exactly if they threatened to walk or they just said, we're going to close. But the word I got was, they're going to close on Thursday or Friday, the day, the next day. Um, And uh, it was, it was one of these situations where, you know, I think there was two entrepreneurs who really wanted to get something done. Uh, but there was a private equity group who really wanted to ensure their position. And the head of the private equity came in, and his name was Carlos, and he came in and he said, I'm really sorry, um, but we we have to have surety of, of closing and you're too early and I don't want to lose the, the bird in the hand that I have mm-hmm. with Lion Capital. So sorry, but you're out. Um, and this this discussion is too short for me to tell you exactly what happened over the next three hours, but there were some funny moments. Um, and we were in Garigas's office, sort of the top law firm in, in Madrid, right in, you know, downtown Madrid. And um, like four o'clock in the afternoon, I had been saying for two or three hours, no, 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 this, you know, this can't happen. Like uh, the entrepreneur, Steve, the founder, he wants to do the deal with me. Um, His wife had gotten involved and she wanted to do the deal. And Melinda had said it was the right choice. And it's like, why would you compromise, you know, what the future of this business wants? And so I tried all sort of the logical ideas and appealing to his sense of right and wrong and telling him the good guys have got to win. And that that resonated. You know, I kept coming back to us like, look, Lion is the one who, who broke the the contract they didn't meet their date you know i'm i haven't missed anything i've told you yet like you you gotta let me win like uh, you just gotta let me win and so i'm I'm getting some momentum with the good guys i gotta win i just keep repeating it like a mantra again i'm like okay in my mind and and there are a whole bunch of cisco yes most leave stories happening on the side like we don't have the cash and we're trying to figure out the cash and we're calling people on the side in new york and everywhere else like could you loan us 10 million? Could you loan us 20 million? How are we going to? Piot flies back to Warsaw to try and get the banks aligned. David's trying to figure out how the hell we're going to get it. So um, I, I, he's, uh, Carlos says, look, I got to go talk to my my board. This, I got to get you out of here. Like, you have to leave the building. Like, you just, you have to go. Like, I've told you no. Like, you just leave, you know? 
And, and it really was that, that basic, like, just leave the building. You're not getting this company goodbye. Like, what, what am I supposed to say to you? So I went to the front door and I laid down on the floor of Garigas's office at the middle of the office. And I laid down there and I basically just started saying, the good guys have got to win and you're screwing this up. And if you want me to leave, you better call the police. And I'm sitting there and Carlos is like, what the hell? Is- this guy's mad. He's out of his mind, right? And I'm like, well, you're going to have to call the police if you want to get me out of here. And Steve's like, Henry, what are you doing? Like, I'm like, no, this is just wrong. And, and wrong will not stand. Like, it just, no, wrong will not stand. And we're going to do this deal. Um, so Carlos uh, came and it became basically like uh, just a nice private equity discussion. He says, okay, three million more and it's yours. And uh, <laughs> so it was a price to pay for lying on the floor. But anyway, it, 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 got, us, on it got us there. <laughs> but what, what what did that learn us that that giving up is not an option or that sometimes you have to do something crazy or what, yeah. what, what you need to be crazy I, or what what does it what does it learn what does it teach us oh i think there's you a need to be resilient multiple. or what's the main learning in there you think i don't know i think there are a lot in there mario i i think there's first of all you know the motivation came down to um being very split between the entrepreneur and the and the finance people and that's something you really have to watch for and i'm in this you know and on that side of this business now and one of the mm. things i wanted most was to appeal to founders and entrepreneurs so they could have the same you know experience i had i i i just had a wonderful life you know i i expected to go back to the united states after one or two years in poland I, this was never the plan to be here 30 years later um certainly was never a plan to i had no restaurant experience i hadn't known one restaurant i never anticipated you know getting to this place so i think that disconnect between steve and carlos was was really important and there was a meeting of the meeting of the mind of the entrepreneurs but not a meeting of the mind between the finance and mm-hmm. and the entrepreneur or the the buyer. So that was one. Um, the fact that it came down to, I mean, it, it took a lot of craziness to get to that point, but it came down to, okay, if you pay a bit more, that's enough, um, which is kind of funny. I mean, it was one and a half percent on the transaction. So in hindsight, you know, it felt like a lot of money, but so I think that's a lesson. The other really big lesson that I, I didn't have as part of the story. I mean, the reason the deal worked, as I said to him, okay, We'll pay the extra, but he wanted to roll over a piece and he was supposed to roll over a piece. And I said, you and I will never be able to do a contract in the next 24 hours, which is what we were promising. But Steve and I will probably do it on a handshake. And so literally Steve and I did a $200 million transaction on a handshake. And we didn't have to come up with a shareholders agreement that included a private equity firm. And um, so we we just exited them. So I told, I think it was Deloitte. It was the, uh, the auditing firm for the transaction. And, and Garigas was the law firm. I don't remember the other law firm. And basically I pulled them all in the room. This is now like, I don't know, five or six o'clock. And I said, we're closing tomorrow at two o'clock. And usually these things take literally weeks. Right. And they were like, you know, that's, that's impossible. And so, you know what I replied, uh, and so <laughs> at some point, at some point, right around then, I said, no one's going home tonight. They were like, what do you mean? No one's going home tonight. I said, no one's going home tonight. And the Deloitte and lawyers, you can imagine, they looked at us like, what? <laughs> like, no one is leaving this building war room. and we're getting this. War room. We're, we're, yeah, war room. We're getting this deal done tonight. And our attorney, our attorney actually passed out at midnight. I laid down on the floor at two o'clock i slept from two to five again on the floor. again <laughs> again on the floor now i just fell asleep and so different people but we got it done and at two o'clock the next day we closed uh and steve and i you learn a lot about somebody when you buy their company because you know how they kept their books you know how they treated people you know you know um yeah. and uh steve was great then and he was great afterwards when you you know you got in and the company was exactly the way he told me it was and I've had a lot of instances where the company was definitely not the way I was told it was. And uh, people don't have the integrity to stand up. They always, they refer to their reps and warranties and their contracts. And I'm always like, where's the rep and warranty on what you told me? 
Um, mm-hmm. And uh, that's pretty frustrating. But yeah, so I think there are, I think there's probably uh, a couple of dozen lessons just in that one moment. Interesting. In, we called we called Clive before that call, and we because he's a, a friend and smart, wise man, and we asked him for one question for you. So he says we should ask you, when have you been most persuasive and retrospective? Have you been right? Question from Clive. Yes, leave it to Clive to be smarter than me. <laughs> Clive is always smarter than me. So, well, of course, I have to go with my wife. I mean, I met her in uh, Bydgoszcz, Poland, and she was sitting with uh, three other beautiful women, and we were they were at the same event we were. We were at an after party, and I was too nervous to go over and say hi. So I sent I sent Joe O'Connor, my marketing director. I was like, Joe, you're in marketing. You can figure out how to get us at that table. <laughs> like you go over and get us at that table, right? So um, we get over to that table, and thanks to Joe, and we're sitting there, and we're 300 kilometers away from my home. And she says, "Where are you from?" And I said, "Wrocław." And she thought I was pulling her leg because she was from Wrocław, um, but neither of us knew that at the moment we met. So that was that was kind of fun, and then. Conversation goes on like an hour and a half. Uh, and it wasn't very long before I was like, gosh, you're exactly the girl I want to marry. And she thought it was just a really corny line from an American, you know, being loud and obnoxious American and just uh, pushing too much. I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm serious. And she's like, not a chance, like get lost, loser. <laughs> and uh, so for the next month, I uh, I tried to get a date and I kept meeting with get lost loser and uh so after a month i got a date and uh yeah so it worked out we're 20 20 24 years later or something like that so i guess i in retrospect i, I was right um but that's probably but, not what clive wanted to hear that's probably <laughs> no, i think i think clive i wanted. think it's i think it's a perfect answer florian you absolutely. wanted to say something yeah before. That, i i mean it's it's absolutely true henry uh, you could tell us uh, tons of stories but i mean from where you started and where you are right now is there something that keeps you currently up at night is there something where you struggle nowadays having your experience and everything you 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 went through how do you handle that today yeah look i i, I never would have I, i really didn't plan to restart another restaurant business i just i wouldn't have that wasn't in the plans in 2019 i had been thinking of selling for a very long time i think i first uh sold chairs in 2012 to warbird pinkus and uh, i um i was thinking of um i For a lot of family reasons, also, I'm not Polish. I didn't intend to stay. So there was, a, you know, but we ended up in a very strange time in 2020 with COVID, right? It, so I went from a, a position of selling at the peak really well. Uh, Amrest was famous for its spectacular culture. We just had a great culture. Um, and so I had cash. All of a sudden, there was an industry in despair. And I had all these great people that were interested in joining back and working together uh, from Amrest. Um, so, I, you know, you, you have people, you have capital, and you have an industry that you like and is fair. And then there were some brands like Gales. I tried to buy Gales before I left. Um, so I got into this, floor not really expecting to be back in, um, but that doesn't speak to your, to your uh, question. What happened, though, in the next two years is is really is another Cisco is mostly a story, right? I mean, I doubt you'll ever meet anybody that raises a first time fund and raises all the money and deploys it in the first year. That was just, it was astounding. You know, uh, everybody's like, don't do a first time fund. And all of a sudden we had more opportunities than we had cash. And that's why Steve and I decided to start a fund. And then as soon as it started, so much was going on. It was hard to read the tea leaves. Uh, it was COVID. You didn't know if things were going to come back, not come back. It was, you know, we had that second wave of COVID in early 2022. Um, and then during that, in July of 2022, we raised our second fund. And that was a much larger fund, $650 million. And so we're, you know, we're 
18 months into that, not even two years into that, and um, we fully deployed our second fund. So what keeps me up at night is, you know, everything we put on our plate. Uh, we put a lot. We put a lot of our capital and most of it as weeks pass by. I think if we'd had this interview in November, or December, I probably would have been like, Phew, I'm not sure if we didn't do too much. Right. Um, but now three months later, a quarter later, we're starting to mark up our funds. Everything is looking stronger and better. Um, so I'm feeling uh, I'm feeling like we're going to do it. We've taken a little bit of a, a slowdown to um, absorb it. We're starting to build more capabilities. And we're bringing in functional people. You know, it's not most funds don't have a head of supply or a head of HR that deals with portfolio companies or a head of IT that help. So we're building sort of what I like from a functional capability to be able to go out and and support. But we didn't have that, and we took on a lot. Um, so that's that's what it was on a broader basis, like the whole world. It's strange when I owned Amrest. You know, you could fly to Russia, you could go to China easily. You, sort of the whole world was open. Yeah. We're seemingly in a very different place just four years later. And um, you know, there's a lot of sadness in some of it. And there's a lot of frustration in some of it because of what's gone on. And um, I, I'm not 100% sure we're going back to the, to the world we, we were in four years ago. Thank you, Henry, for sharing. I think we have a, a wrap-up question. Um, this is a podcast for entrepreneurs from entrepreneurs, and, and you act as a coach, a mentor, an investor, and board member. If some entrepreneurs comes and hits the wall and struggles, what's the first thing you look into? What, what is the guidance out? What's the, the first tool set you hand over to them based on your experience? They struggle, they are lost, they hit the wall. What is it what they what they need to do? Well, I guess uh, there have been a ton of books written on this, but probably the first thing to keep in mind is that most entrepreneurs are successful their second time, not their first time. So, so try again, right? So, you know, like uh, it, it's not easy and try again. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. And then the second thing to keep in mind is what I've spent the entire time on this call talking about, just as much Liva. As of, you know, I was, I was having a coaching moment with my son yesterday. He plays hockey and uh, they're in the playoffs and he's in the semifinals of the playoffs right now. And I was talking to him after a quarterfinals game and he made that horrible mistake of saying the coach didn't play me. And he was all down because he didn't get enough playing time. And I was just like, God, that's just wrong, Matthew. Um, you're captain of the team. Like, mm. what do you, what's more important for you to feel better because you played but lose or focus on the team and win? And are you going to feel better if you've won and not played or played and lost? Um, like you got to get your head in and be captain and, and lead right now. And instead of thinking about ego. And so I was like, you know, get the hell, get the ego out and focus on the puck. And if, as long as you're focused on the ego, you're going to lose. And as long as you're focused on the puck, you're going to win. Um, and I think that's, that's really it, you know, like focus on the puck, focus on what matters. The good guys have got to win. So if you're a good guy, and you're focused on the puck, you're going to win. Uh, but you're going to have to be pretty crazy or hard-headed or um, unique or creative or whatever because it's not all set up for you to win. But if you're a good guy and you're focused on the puck, you'll win. Wow. What a first episode, Florian. What do you think? What's uh, in for us after hearing all of that? Fantastic uh, uh, guest and uh, fantastic premier guest, I would say. Uh, 
but too took short. the bar quite high. Yeah. Yeah, too short, <laughs> but a lot, a, a lot in it is 35 yeah. minutes. Like I have a lot of learnings here. What, what are your learnings? Let's compare notes a little bit. Okay, I, I start with one of my learnings. Uh, what I completely liked is the good guys got a win. Mm, and, a good uh, one. Uh, this is uh, this is probably something you can always remember. Uh, if you believe you're on the right track, then you belong to the good guys, and then you need to win. Even and though I if you're it's also out. a sentence you can bring, like as Henry said, you can bring to uh, behind that sentence a lot of your people, and it becomes like a mantra. Right. <clears throat> I mean, he put it to the extreme. I mean, going to a lawyer's office in Madrid and putting yourself on the floor and said like call the police or or we make the deal I mean that's a that's putting it to the top the good guys have to win I, I had that too obviously knowing Henry for so long time right. anything is possible is another is a is another mantra and I think it sounds so easy but it really in a culture where Schwarzenegger wrote something uh, similar in his book, he says you need to get rid of the naysayers. Uh, the naysayers, they are the problem. And I think to to go to the naysayers and say anything is possible, just like there must be a way. And yeah. Henry gave a lot of examples where there is actually a way. But first of all, I think you need to believe that yeah. there is a way. Absolutely. Anything is possible. The good guys have to win. What else, Florian? Uh, try again. Uh, there's mm -hmm. uh, Most entrepreneurs aren't successful for the first time, but then for the second. So try again. Good, try again. I, I had that too. And I think this coaching session um, with the son, yeah. which was at the end, I was very happy he shared that because it says focus on the buck and get the ego out. Eh? Yeah. I think like also like not being in the self-pity and make the crisis and the struggle about you. Yeah. As a good leader, focus on the company, focus on the team, yeah, focus on the puck. Absolutely. And if you I mean, the the theme of this podcast from doubt to drive, it actually uh, this amplifies it even more because he also said, focus on ego and you lose. And doubt mm. has a lot to do with ego. And if you then can change it and turn it into a bigger picture if it's the company or the cause or the idea or whatever um, it, it will lead you to success and to drive a great first episode anything yeah, is possible anything Good is guys possible. have to win and focus on the bug let's see what we're gonna learn next week goodbye Absolutely. Florian Good goodbye bye, listeners Mario. tune in bye <laughs> bye, bye. bye. <laughs> wow we hope you've enjoyed this episode as much as we did. But sharing is not just caring, it is also empowering. So recommend this podcast to fellow entrepreneurs who might need a dose of inspiration. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you'll never miss out on future episodes. Thank you for being part of the community from Doubt to Drive Entrepreneurs Only. Mario and Florian are already gearing up for the next episode. Until then, stay tuned, stay driven, and we'll be back next week.